I know what you're thinking. How on earth can the world's biggest game, Fortnite, be on the chopping block, and how did it find its way onto this series? Fortnite in 2020 might still be the world's biggest game, but there are two different Fortnites, and while one is known for the global success aforementioned, the other, well, now we're getting to the mystery. Fortnite originally was set to be a cooperative, tower defense, slash build and shoot 'em up title for the PC only. It quickly evolved into much more until in 2017 when Epic Games launched the Battle Royale game mode, and the rest is history. Following that, Fortnite became Fortnite Save the World, and was moved to the back as a separate team was tasked with its more successful Younger Brother game mode. Fortnite Save the World never got the same shine that the multiplayer PvP shooter did, nor the same focus overall, eventually reaching the point that some thought the game was going to be abandoned, unfinished, completely in favor of the BR. With news in the summer of 2020 stating that Fortnite Save the World would be put on the shelf as the game launched and would receive a fraction of the content, the future of the cooperative Fortnite mode is uncertain. On this episode of Death of a Game, we uncover the original Fortnite, its tumultuous development cycle, the long pre-launch, and its subsequent eclipsing by the genre slash mode that took over the world. Don't worry though, detectives, the dances, that's for another video. Normally on the death of a game, we start at the very beginning of the story. Epic Games as a company, however, has had a history that spans back nearly 30 years. In an effort to keep this video shorter, and to the point, I'm going to start at the inception of the idea and the game that we know today as Fortnite. Epic Games was known throughout the 90s and the early 2010s for a strong control of the multiplayer shooter market with video game hits like Unreal Tournament and the subsequent mega engine that came from it, and then the Gears of War trilogy. Epic Games was also known for two of the most iconic video game developers, Cliff Blazinski, the creative behind the aforementioned titles, and Tim Sweeney, the founder of Epic Games and the creator of the Unreal Engine. Although Epic Games had a long, dominant run in the shooter market, their time in the sun by 2010 had come and gone to a certain extent. With games and titles like Counter-Strike, Battlefield, and COD still around full steam ahead, Epic wasn't on top anymore. Epic Games had spent many of those years being a dominant engine provider as well, and they were looking to now in 2011 leverage their engine and even more, leverage their talent to create another hit worthy of the Epic name. Following a bit of Gears of War burnout, Epic Games by the end of 2011 was scheduling a game jam. Game jams are an iconic event in video game development where games are made based on creativity and excitement and the game is then prototyped very quickly. The inspiration for Fortnite seemed to coincide somewhere between a building game and a survival game, at least in its early iterations. As producer Roger Collum put it, Minecraft slash Terraria were the peanut butter and something like Gears of War was the chocolate. Typically, these two hadn't been mixed together. As Roger Collum explains, no single title had covered all of these aspects outlined in a game. When you have the engine, the talent, and the passion, that's how great influential video games are made. If Epic Games could get the peanut butter and chocolate recipe just right, just like with a magical combination, the result would be truly addicting. Cliff Bozinski, who was taking a break from game development at the time, had packed up his Gears of War bags and was already working on the next potential big Epic Games project, Fortnite. Fortnite would be announced at the 2011 Spike VGAs by Mr. Cliff Bozinski himself with a quaint teaser trailer to boot. Cliff even stated, likely as a way to distance the game from being compared to Gears of War, that Fortnite had no dude bros in it. And what this meant in the larger picture wasn't exactly going to be shown yet. The art direction for Fortnite certainly would prove to be important, as the game was a stark departure from the dark and gloomy settings Epic was known for with Gears of War. Although Fortnite started with the intentions of just being this cooperative builder-shooter game, it very much quickly evolved to much more. Borrowing from the MMORPG genre RPG elements and progression, Fortnite would utilize ex-MMO Locho developer Darren Sugg, who would join the team sometime in 2012. Darren Sugg had the experience of working on Lord of the Rings Online, as well as the Minds of Moria expansion, and his goal working with Fortnite was to create compelling enough systems to keep people interested in the game long term. The perfect job for an MMO developer.
Fortnite didn't have the most typical development cycle so far, and things would get even more complicated in June of 2012 when mega publisher of League of Legends fame Tencent would acquire a minority interest in Epic Games. This prompted Rod Ferguson and more to promptly leave the company. Rod would later admit that had he stayed, he very likely would have cancelled Fortnite at this time. Epic Games selling a minority stake in their company seems inconsequential, but it opens up the door for a larger takeover at a later date. Tencent was interested in Epic Games, who was interested in scaling up in more ways than one, so they could help each other. A month following the news of the involvement of Tencent came news in July of 2012 that Epic Games wouldn't just be developing Fortnite as a game, but be developing it with their brand new engine, Unreal Engine 4. How exactly this would complicate things is hard to quantify. But since Fortnite started in Unreal 3, porting over to another engine in the middle of development is never a positive regarding potential roadblocks and logistical issues. Epic Games, however, wanted to make sure that Fortnite wasn't just going to be a special game, it was going to be the first special game to utilize the new Unreal Engine 4. The added bonus of using Fortnite, if successful, for Unreal Engine 4 means that it effectively would be a live test environment of sorts for new features, systems, and engine aspects. Unreal Engine 4 tech is and was impressive. Everything in Fortnite, for example, was destructible by your pickaxe. The destructibility of all assets in the game were a key aspect of the game in the engine. This would have the bonus effects of positively affecting potentially other future games in development for Epic Games, or other games who decided to use the Unreal Engine 4. Porting Fortnite to Unreal Engine 4 from Unreal Engine 3 couldn't have been easy, considering this port process has historically been very difficult and not very successful. Epic Games on hit Bulletstorm had worked with the cult classic painkiller famed developer People Can Fly. They would yet again team up with Epic to work on Fortnite. Although for some strange reason we don't have the most clear marking of who did what. The interview done with Game Informer has the Fortnite producer Roger Collum explaining that the Fortnite team existed of 110 devs, the bulk of which were the team from People Can Fly. Following their acquisition by Epic Games, People Can Fly would lose three of its leading creative and executive talents. Now this isn't out of the ordinary following acquisitions depending on the kind of acquisition, but to leave the company following the acquisition so abruptly usually means that something was amok. People Can Fly founder Adrian Chimlar stated that the reason for their departure was due to the nature of how Epic was approaching games, partially influenced by Tencent's recent investment into the company to help them develop games as a service. While Tencent undoubtedly entered the picture with Epic Games with a fat checkbook and the power needed to create a global powerhouse video game, they were a company that, especially in the West, had a dubious reputation at best. One who was intent on one successful business model in particular, games as a service. As a company from China, Tencent and their policies and ethics concerning microtransactions, simply put, are a different beast altogether. Apparently so much so that in 2012, after being acquired, the top talent at the company that's going to be the main developer behind your game is unwilling to work with you, yeah, that doesn't spell well for the microtransactions going forward. The only kind of titles Tencent really associated with was free-to-play titles, and that was because that's a low barrier to entry, which means more chances to make dough. In a shocking event in the fall, Cliff Blazinski, who was heavily involved in the inception of Fortnite, would depart Epic Games in October of 2012. Darren Sugg after this point took over lead on Fortnite. Cliff might not have been on the project any longer, but considering Epic Games was a studio for shooters, the game still very well could be in good hands. Just not the same main hands that created your biggest past shooters. Fortnite being developed in conjunction with Paragon, as well as a development done on the new engine, Unreal Engine 4, couldn't have been cheap. And likely in a move to scale up even more, Epic Games would take on more funding from Tencent on March 21st, 2013. This would now put up the Tencent investment amount to a total of 40% ownership of Epic Games, worth $330 million. This acquisition would have far-reaching effects, effects we are still feeling even in 2020 today, and likely will beyond that. But for Fortnite, it likely meant more delays, as new players entered the scene. Epic Games announced on November 1st, 2013 that Fortnite would not be releasing in 2013, but they were targeting a 2014 release date instead. To close out the year of 2013 was the news that recently acquired People Can Fly would be renamed to Epic Games Poland. Changing an acquired company's name isn't that strange, nor is it to changing the name to a subsidiary styled name. But I always have gotten this sneaky suspicion with Fortnite that those involved kind of wanted it to be a bit muddled in regards to who did what. I know that sounds a bit kind of conspiracy theory and I mean, come on, what do you guys expect? I am a detective after all. But why do most people who talk about Fortnite have no idea who Epic Games Poland or People Can Fly is? Branding. 
and I don't think that's by accident. According to the creative lead of Epic Games, Donald Mustard, Fortnite by 2014 had a pretty functional prototype with most of the Unreal 4 engine elements smoothed out. Due to Epic Games developing five different games and attempting to get their games as a service business model set up, they would likely have to delay the game potentially another three years. That's right, the monetization model surrounding Fortnite was a big reason why the game was getting continuously delayed. Epic Games had to make sure to get things right the first time around, to maximize their profit. Damn them for good business, especially after Tencent just invested $330 million into your company. Delaying a game launch for a business model is a good idea for business, but what would that mean for prospective fans ready to play Fortnite? Only time would tell, but if history was any lesson, from Tencent, microtransactions and lots of them were coming. More details would be trickled out 2014, Epic Games would state that Fortnite will throw players into unscripted events, the game features an RPG-like progression system and Diablo-like looting. Alpha signups were also opened up at the same time. Polygon got some hands-on experience with Fortnite and released an article concerning their thoughts July 8th, 2014. Fortnite is a class-based game with three phases, two of which usually last as long as a player wish before someone triggers the third showdown phase. You scavenge their landscape for raw materials, build up your weapons, load out and erect a fortress, and then, when everyone's ready, push the big button and fend off a zombie horde. If Fortnite's AI director, which may be the most important participant in the game, is doing its job properly, then no matter how much you've built up that fort or your armaments, you'll get a white knuckle finish. Of the classes were four different hero classes, constructors, ninjas, outlanders, and soldiers. Constructors being just like they imply, builders, and soldiers and ninjas being the combat class for ranged and melee weapons respectively. While outlanders were the most versatile of the classes, serving as the class with both gadgets and treasure hunting abilities. Polygon also got some experience viewing an apparent Fortnite PvP match, where teams would fight amongst each other, then zombies would get sent after you to help break up the monotony or the one-sidedness of the contest. Polygon wasn't so fond of the mode though, however, stating that Fortnite's player versus player has a long way to go before it's as compelling as its cooperative campaign. Fortnite would hold its first alpha December 2nd, 2014. It's a little rough around the edges, but we're excited to hear feedback from real players and take the first step in bringing Fortnite to everyone. Mike Fisher, Epic Games' VP of Publishing, admitted in 2015 that Epic Games had probably announced Fortnite too soon and that the delay in the game's development cycle was due to very good reasons. Fortnite would kick off its second closed alpha the spring of 2015, and at this point of the development of the game, PvP was still a part of the game and about repelling enemy teams or conquering bases. Epic was promising a 2015 release now, and whether or not 2015 release would be the case would remain to be seen. But considering the delays so far, it was leaning towards a no. PC Gamer dubbed Fortnite in their hands-on of the game in June of 2015 as a sandbox tower defense game that uses low-key Minecraft as its opening act. PC Gamer enjoyed the pacing of the game, how there were moments when you scavenged and traveled for things, and then the moments where you focused on fighting and defending the structures or area in question. It didn't seem as if PC Gamer had much experience playing the supposed PvP mode though, and the last time we had heard about someone's experiences playing the PvP mode, it wasn't exactly glowing reviews, which was troubling for Fortnite. Was Fortnite struggling as a PvE-centric game to include a PvP component? Whatever the case may be, they were seemingly going back to the drawing board concerning people's reception with the PvP modes thus far. Epic Games wouldn't just be targeting the PC audience as of 2015 anymore, they would bring Fortnite to the Mac, and then promise that a beta would be coming the fall of 2015. Unreal Engine 4 was now able to be played on the Mac, with Fortnite as the proving ground. In an interesting turn, People Can Fly, who had been acquired by Epic and then renamed to Epic Games Poland, had regained their independence from Epic and announced working on an unannounced project of their own. I don't know for sure if they're still involved in Fortnite in any capacity as of today, but based on what I could uncover, it doesn't look like it. Whether they did want to continue to work on the game or not, or didn't want to be under a Tencent-influenced Epic Games, we can't be entirely sure. With Fortnite quietly in closed beta, Epic Games would announce a new title, a third-person MOBA dubbed Paragon, the same one I covered on this series by the way. As the article states, GameSpot asked Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney about the status of Fortnite and he explained that the studio's focus moved to Paragon, and we figure we should start with one major successful launch and do one at a time. Fortnite will be next. Tim did emphasize that Fortnite was moving full speed ahead and was a big priority for Epic, but that the game was complex and took time to get right. 
At this point, Fortnite was announced five years ago, and Epic Games was still unable and unready to launch the game. With their shifting focus to Paragon, Fortnite was on the back burner for the rest of 2016. Epic Games was targeting 2017 as the big year for Fortnite. Well, sort of. The game wasn't ready for a full release yet, but with the rise of the early access market, they could afford to early release the game so they could self-publish and self-fund the development of the game while simultaneously continuing to develop and update the game. Not that I think a company the size of Epic Games needs to ever rely on early access personally, they were likely facing pressure from above to launch the game, and launching the game unfinished no matter what, with PvP modes still in limbo, was not the best idea. Epic creative lead Donald Mustard dropped a bombshell that when Fortnite was announced in 2011, it was three weeks after we came up with the idea, before we even made the game. Ah, so that explains some of it, but that's where things get a bit confusing though. And that's the business model concerning Fortnite. The game was going to be free to play, but was going to cost $40 at the start. Let me repeat that. The game was going to be free to play after it fully launched, but in order to play Fortnite early on, you had to pre-order for your founder's pack of the game. Now this wouldn't be a strange thing if we didn't have the beauty of hindsight and know that Fortnite would remain an early access title for years. Epic would announce the prices for the Founders Pack June of 2017, and the early access date to boot. The game might not have been finished yet, but Epic Games was confident that there was enough in the game to attract an audience willing to fund them pre-launch, and they were right, breaking 500,000 pre-orders. Nearly six years after being announced, Epic Games would finally, after summoning the strength from multiple in-house studios and People Can Fly, launch Fortnite on early access July 2017. IGN impressions of the game were middling, giving the title a temporary rating of 6.5 out of 10. Fortnite is a fun world with great action gameplay and clever building systems, hamstrung by overlapping progression systems that force you into monotonous missions for diminishing returns. That soon tarnishes its great first impression. While the constant updates and events add flares of new gameplay and speak to the potential of Fortnite in the long run, the longer I play it, the less patience I have for its rules. GameSpot stated that Fortnite suffered from free-to-play obstacles, meanwhile being a pay-to-play game. These obstacles would be things such as the immense grind in the game required for progression and the repetitive nature behind missions. This could be expedited by you spending money on the cash shop present in the game to a certain extent, especially concerning one of the most infamous parts of Fortnite, llamas. Yep, llamas. Loot llamas in particular are one of the main ways to acquire things such as hero cards, guns, traps, and survivors which were NPCs that could aid you. These cost V-Bucks, and V-Bucks were a currency that could be slowly earned in-game, but required you mostly to purchase them with real-life cash. Because these llamas or loot boxes essentially contained heroes and rare weapons at random, the game was essentially ripe for pay-to-win in the way of weapons and heroes, which are the definition of power. Paying for power, whether a PvE game or not, was by definition pay-to-win. In Destructoid's review of Fortnite's early access launch, they explained that Fortnite has solid action that helps with its repetitive nature, and there are enough hooks to keep players' attention as they come back for more. I really can't shake the feeling that some parts were reworked into a free-to-play game since it was announced in 2014 that it would become one. And, well, this is absolutely true, considering that's when Epic had the big Tencent investment and the big transition towards games as a service. All of the reviewers I mentioned before, while highlighting the obvious unfinished aspects of Fortnite, an early access title, were positive mostly concerning the game. Not quite the response Epic was writing on, however, especially considering Paragon wasn't on the best trajectory at the time either. Had Epic Games made an insanely expensive mistake concerning Fortnite? Now, the game was doing fine by any normal game standards, but with all of the expectations and weight on the game, it was going to have to do much better than that. Fortnite would eclipse 1 million players by August 18th, 2017. Not quite Overwatch numbers, but for a paid early access, these numbers weren't bad. Fortnite was a mission-based cooperative shooter, not a true survival building style game such as Minecraft or Rust. With the implementation of their survival mode in August of 2017, however, that no longer would be the case. The survival mode, which is arguably one of the best features of the game in my eyes, was the mode that you would construct a base in, and then would have to defend the base for between 3 to 14 in-game days. The longer you would survive, the better the rewards. More modes were planned for Fortnite, as the game continued to evolve in early access. The newest mode edition would come September 26, 2017, and change the world. 
Fortnite BR, which as explained later on in a Rolling Stone interview, was in development since the early access launch of Fortnite. The Epic Unreal Tournament team, another game for another video speaking of which, had been tasked with the Fortnite BR. But two weeks before the BR launch on the 26th, Epic Game Studio heads changed their mind concerning the mode. They instead thought it would be better released as a separate mode, which would then take the PvP portion of Fortnite out of the paid realm of the game and enter the free-to-play realm. Fortnite BR would be free to play. This move might have been one of the most pivotal moves for Fortnite's massive success. This not only meant that PvP and PvE modes were separated by a price tag, it also meant that they were now going to have to separate the two by name. Fortnite became Fortnite Save the World, and Fortnite BR just simply became Fortnite. This move was apparently effective enough to even get me involved as I heard about the new epic multiplayer shooter. But we won't be covering the trajectory of the Fortnite multiplayer shooter from this point on, only when it's related to the story of the main topic at hand which is Fortnite Save the World, the PvE portion of the game. Fortnite in regards to a Death of a Game series might as well be the Grim Reaper at this point though. As 2018 came into the picture, Fortnite Save the World was quietly chugging ahead with success. Meanwhile, Fortnite BR, in a mere month, had become the world's largest BR. The success of Fortnite overall was great for Epic Games. It exploded the company's growth and propelled them into the limelight. But maybe the BR mode outshining the Save the World mode wasn't good in the long run, at least for Save the World. BR content was player-driven. A hundred players spawned and then dynamically having content created amongst each other and then experiencing this content? That's going to be a lot more repeatable than PvE content, which although it is more dynamic in a game like Fortnite Save the World because of the procedurally generated maps, was inherently more expensive to create because it required things such as voice actors, cutscenes, writers, a storyline, and ultimately, the missions and the content itself. Considering Epic Games was already considering shuttering Paragon, following its less than stellar results, it wasn't out of the question that Fortnite Save the World could be next on the chopping block. Fortnite's insane success after being placed on the back burner for Paragon was now rising from the bench and upsetting the starter on the roster, Tom Brady-esque. So much so that Paragon very likely wouldn't survive much longer. Fortnite Save the World on its own merit, especially compared to the free Fortnite BR, was not worth the money. At least not yet. Epic Games realizing the success of their BR would try and leverage such for the Save the World audience. Epic Games, for example, would give BR players the chance to unlock V-Bucks daily, as well as special skins for purchasing and playing Fortnite Save the World. Epic tried to acknowledge the worried fans, though, as updates and communication for Fortnite Save the World had certainly diminished, assuring them that more updates were indeed planned and a roadmap was on the table. By the spring of 2018, Fortnite Save the World, although still being updated, simply wasn't getting the same rub anymore from Epic Games. But to reassure people, the head of Fortnite Publishing, Ed Zobris, stated that, I'm happy to state that retention is high. Here we are over six months later, and our audience is larger now than it's ever been for Save the World, not just for the Battle Royale. So according to Epic, things were going just fine. Fortnite originally was targeted at being a PvE Horde Tower defense style game, but with the insane success of Fortnite BR, the PvE side of things was becoming more and more neglected. Fortnite fans were wondering, was the BR mode going to continue to eclipse Fortnite Save the World until eventually there was nothing left, especially because of the bugs, balancing issues, and lack of content in the game? The complaints about Fortnite STW were fair considering that in 2018 it still cost a box price meanwhile the BR component was free. This wouldn't have been as big of an issue unless as I mentioned before, Fortnite Save the World was designed to make money from microtransactions, aka designed as a free to play title. The free to play launch was targeted for 2018, but news came in October of 2018 that the launch would be delayed. Save the World has grown consistently since our launch in July of 2017, and Fortnite overall has experienced unprecedented growth. So we're taking the time to get this right. Epic Games wouldn't give up support on Fortnite Save the World yet though, which at this point would always at least get some trickle or crossover from the BR audience, for the rewards especially. Big changes were planned for the end of 2018 for Fortnite Save the World. Epic set it out with a lot of goals. It wants the UI to be easier to understand and navigate, while leaving room to grow. It also wants the front end to have more life and character. With that end, it's created a new home base menu staffed by characters players meet during the campaign. Fortnite Save the World would come under fire though in the spring of 2019, as they were sued concerning the predatory Loot Llamas. Epic would then end blind draw loot boxes allowing players to show the contents within. Two years later though, the money had already been made, and a lot of it. 
This probably didn't make Tencent very happy to continue to support Save the World, though. Fortnite Save the World was promised another free-to-play launch in July of 2019, but that also, for the fourth time now, would never come. Jumping forward roughly a year, and well, the story has been full of twists and turns, and to complete that tradition came a final twist that inevitably led to Fortnite Save the World being put on the back burner. According to The Verge, after the success of Fortnite's free-to-play battle royale mode, Epic had planned to make Save the World similarly free, but with today's announcement, it seems those plans have changed as it slows down development on Save the World instead. Remaining pay-to-play and another cherry on top of it all. In the same day, Epic Games had both launched and sort of stopped supporting the game at the same time. Fortnite Save the World might have been the quieter, older brother to the more successful younger Fortnite BR, but it still managed to hold a cult audience of loyal fans. Those who still believed in the original vision brought forth by Epic Games concerning the game. Fortnite Save the World fans launched a Save the World hashtag to try and keep the mode alive, because although the game was made to take place over four major acts, the game was only 75% complete with no completion in sight, and at one point it going a thousand days without any significant update. Unfortunately, as of August 2020, this seems to have fallen on deaf ears. What use though does Epic have to continue to pump money into something that's clearly less successful? especially when a large complaint since the inception of the game has always been the game's complexity. UIs and menus had been problematic in Fortnite Save the World since the beginning, because it wasn't a typical shooter formula. It was basically closer to Destiny or Diablo than Rust, or even an MMO by design. This wasn't particularly appealing to a younger Fortnite PR audience, and the game was even more complicated for older, more seasoned gamers. As it stands, Fortnite Save the World will likely suffer the fate of fading into obscurity as it struggles to gain new players and even hold existing ones. The fact that Fortnite Save the World was playable for a number of years while being unfinished meant that it burnt out a number of players who might have originally tried the title out, but weren't going to go back again and try it later. The BR portion being playable early on isn't as big as a problem because the content is PvP, which inherently has better replayability. No matter how different an area is generated by the tech behind Fortnite, most missions just end up being locating an object, building up fortifications, and defending the area from husks. Rinse and repeat, and rinse and repeat, and rinse and repeat. Largely, the missions don't evolve past this. Well, besides the odd explorations type mission, here and there, and of course, every now and then, the story missions. With the exception, maybe, of the SSD missions or the Storm Shield defense missions I mentioned beforehand, which were the closest thing to a persistent world of actual survival for Fortnite. Long term exposure cooped with a slow content trickle and repetitive content to boot, well, that has poor player retention written all over it. When that music starts playing and the fedora's on the head, that means a mystery is about to be solved. That's right, it's time for the final deduction where we gather all of the clues obtained along the journey and review the largest contributing factors in the death of a game, Fortnite Save the World. A long, tumultuous development cycle didn't do the game any favors. The combination of the game being overexposed, announced early, a slow content trickle, and repetitive content really hurt player retention. Fortnite BR eclipsed not just Fortnite Save the World, but kind of every other game in the world. PvE content simply cost more than PvP content, and the payoff for Epic wasn't worth it. Save the World, or Fortnite as it was originally dubbed, was cursed with games as a service-itis, where you're pressured to spend money or be bored to death. Fortnite Save the World is still currently playable today, as of August 2020, and you can purchase the game for under $20. That price point might be much closer to an agreeable price point for most players, but as of 2020, the scene is much more competitive. Fortnite BR, although it certainly has slowed in some ways, still continues to be a titan in the online shooter space. Will Fortnite Save the World always be remembered as the forgotten sibling? Or will it be remembered for the positive aspects of the game mode, such as being the only reason the mega successful BR mode exists in the first place? The original vision for Fortnite has certainly shifted in ways beyond imagining, but I don't think Epic and the team are exactly complaining. Thanks for watching, guys. We used to look up at the sky and wonder what was out there.